Thank you very much, everyone. I'm, my name is Michael Small. I'm the Executive Director of Carbon Talks and Renewable Cities here at Simon Fraser University's Center for Dialogue. It's a great pleasure to have you all here today for what I would say is our first Carbon Talk of the new season, at least the new academic season and fall term. Um, and our series of public Carbon Talks, they're dialogues. And the format for those of you who've not been here before, and it's nice to see people who've been regular attendees as well as uh, quite a few new faces at our events. Um, our guest speaker, and I'll introduce our speaker in a minute, uh, will speak usually for 15 to 20 minutes, and then we use the remainder of the time for questions and comment, ideally even comment between members of the audience. We, we try to put the accent on dialogue. This is a great room for that purpose. Uh, these events are being live webcast, and that's courtesy of the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. So in addition to all of you in the room, um, there is a growing number, I'm very pleased to say, of people who are watching this live online in other parts of the province and indeed other parts of the world. Uh, when we get to the dialogue portion, uh, we'll of course take comments and questions from people in the room, but we very much welcome people tweeting or emailing comments uh, to us and we'll have the appropriate uh, hashtags up on the screen for that purpose if anyone does not know what they are. Um, I'd like to just emphasize that we're, as always, very grateful to our sponsors for these events, the SFU Center for Dialogue, which hosts us as a program, the North Growth Foundation, who, who has made the whole Public Carbon Talks program possible, and the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, which specifically makes these webcasts possible. Uh, our presenter today is uh, Deborah Harford. She's the Executive Director of Adaptation to Climate Change Team uh, here at uh, Simon Fraser University. I think it's safe to say she's one of Canada's best known experts on the issue of adaptation. And we're delighted to have her along with our program as part of a broader climate solutions team here at SFU. I'll let her describe more of her work. Today she's going to be talking about uh, not just adaptation, but going how those issues of adaptation integrate with issues of climate mitigation or carbon reduction and how they come together around a concept of resilience, which she wants to explain to us and as being important for British Columbia, for Canada and doubtless for the world. So with that, I'll uh, give the floor to uh, Deborah. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm gonna grab a mic. If, if it's all right with you guys, I'm gonna stand up. Um, is it on? Yes. Um, I just find it easier to speak when I've got a column of air that goes all the way up. Um, so um, I'm a Climate Solutions Fellow at the Centre for Dialogue, and I've been running the Adaptation to Climate Change team at Simon Fraser University for 10 years this year. It's our decade, so. Uh, I feel younger and stronger already. Um, so it, this is a, a, a topic that ACT, uh, my organization, which um, principally looks at climate change adaptation and how uh, governments at all levels in Canada might respond. Um, we, we looked at adaptation because we felt that there was a dearth of information about it, what it actually meant, what kinds of climate impacts should we be looking at, what should governments be doing about it, but we never proposed it as an alternative to emissions reduction. In fact, I would say emissions reduction is much more important because we can't adapt to runaway climate change. And as I'll show you, we're getting close to implementation of both climate change mitigation, emissions reduction, and adaptation solutions. And both of those things are very infrastructure uh, heavy, will require a lot of investment, and it's probably time we started integrating them and trying to think about how they connect to one another for more than one reason. So just on the adaptation side, we know that even though we're reducing our emissions, we have every intention to do so. We've already locked in a level of climate change while it's very important, as I've said, to reduce our emissions, we have to think about how we're going to respond to the climate change impacts that we know are coming. And there's a great deal of uncertainty in terms of those projections. So the BC guideline for sea level rise that's already in bylaws for municipalities in Metro Vancouver is one meter by 2100. But in April of this year, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Margaret Davison said something really terrifying. She said, that it might be three meters by 2050. And I was, nobody put this out there in the media. This was, she said this at the Risk and Insurance Management Society conference in the US to 10,000 risk managers. It came out in an insurance journal. And uh, so she says, well, this, the science isn't uh, peer reviewed. This won't be uh, out yet. Um, that, so that's very extreme. But this is what municipalities are trying to figure out how to deal with. And it's not just municipalities, it's the insurers. Um, you can see the trend there on catastrophic loss in Canada. 
That goes up to 2014, that huge spike that you see there is the Calgary and Toronto floods, but since then it's gone up higher, we've had Fort Mac. Um, both of the flooding and the fires are connected to climate change and are projected to get more severe, we're projected to see more extreme events like that. And Canada's parliamentary budget officer predicts that extreme weather will cost Canadians about $5 billion a year between 2016 and 2020. And this here is what the federal government pays out uh, to municipalities and to the uninsured. So you can see it's already had a major spike. So that's, we're all paying that, it's taxpayer money. July 2016 was the hottest month since human record keeping began. Uh, it was something like the 13th or 14th hottest month in a row for the standards for each month. But so we're seeing a definite uh, signal of climate change over and above the El Nino that's been happening. Um, so these things are already affecting us. And the World Economic Forum's 2016 report for global risks uh, did something, again, that was a, an absolute first. It put the failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation as its top concern for the next 10 years. Interestingly though, the other ones that are the top concerns are all very connected to climate change impacts as we see them projected. Extreme weather, food crises, and profound social instability uh, are all connected to climate change impacts. Now, as somebody who's worked on adaptation for 10 years, I thought we were doing a really good thing. I thought, you know, this is gonna help hopefully uh, avoid losses, save people money, save people time. Um, this makes sense. But there's a concern emerging at the UN, the highest levels of the UN, that there might be a fallacy in this thinking that we need to be very careful that we're not going to fall prey to. We know that those who contribute the least greenhouse gases will be the most impacted by climate change. Small island states are going under because of sea level rise. Bangladesh is drowning because of flooding, because of their elevation. So you can see here's the emissions. <laughs> And here's the vulnerability. So what we do affects people elsewhere. And this is starting to come into uh, our climate change planning in Canada, um, in which what we're afraid of is that we're gonna see a situation in which we build great big walls around ourselves and continue to admit as though we don't feel very vulnerable. Because we don't, let's face it, we're insured. Um, sure, there's vulnerabilities and our municipalities in this region are busy planning for that. Um, but at the same time, the emissions reduction incentive, uh, Im imperative is not really that obvious. So while we're, I was in Surrey yesterday, they're gonna start building seawalls, they're trying to figure out their coastal risk protection strategy, but it's not tied to emissions reduction. So there was an article that came out on the 22nd from Seth Klein at the Canadian Centre for Polity Policy Alternatives talking about the new climate denialism. And in short, that's Trudeau saying, sure, we need to switch to renewables, but we need fossil fuels to get us there. And that's being said by the oil industry as well. Uh, Bill McKibben in his article that came out on the same day showed that in the current fossil fuel industry, we have 942 gigatons ready to go. It's ready to go. This is not new stuff. It's, it's, this isn't stuff we have to pull out, a, you know, do more exploration for. But we can only burn 353 gigatons if we want a 50-50 chance, only a 50-50 chance of staying within 1.5 degrees. The main sort of COP goal is to stay under two. We can burn 800 gigatons. That's still a fair bit less than 942. But James Hansen today posted a graph that shows we've already warmed 1.3. Now, if you listen to the Association of Small Island States at the last year's COP, the, the message was 1.5 to stay alive, and Catherine McKenna championed that. But uh, we're very, it's gonna be really, really, really hard to do that. So, um, to cut a long story short, this is really sad that that's cut off, because, well, that's kind of our situation. We are morally bound to bring these two processes together. Sure, we can't let our municipalities go under, and our, our industries, but we can't do it if we don't, we can't justify building fortress North America while Bangladesh drowns. But this isn't new thinking. Um, and this was 2008. This is a quadrant, uh, sorry, a graph. Um, and on the uh, horizontal axis, you've got emissions being increased and emissions being reduced. So we're trying to go over here, this is mitigation. And on this axis, you've got vulnerability to climate change reducing and increasing, so we're trying to go up here. So this is where we want to be, in this quadrant here. 
And so this was already, de de already described by some of our uh, really um, innovative climate adaptation researchers uh, in 2008, but it hasn't been taken up because people were too, too busy arguing about was climate change real? We had 10 years of the Harper government, which let's just, you know, that argument continued. Um, and, you know, meanwhile, planning went on, but the two streams, climate change adaptation and climate change mitigation, did not come together. They diverged. They went like that, they went like that. Now, we are getting closer to implementation of both of those streams for a bunch of different reasons. And one of them is that all the international agreements that have been made recently, the Paris Agreement last year, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction last year, the UN SDGs last year, and the Fifth Assessment Report from the IPCC. So all these came out last year. All of them are influencing international decision making. They all state, we must do mitigation, we must do adaptation. We may see a national price on carbon in Canada in the November plan from the federal government that will come out. There's going to be a national plan that's been worked out between the feds and the provinces. We have our program here at SFU, Renewable Cities, that Michael is the head of. Vancouver has pledged 100% renewable energy by 2050. We know there are going to be major disruptions, disruptive technologies, EVs, driverless cars that are going to transform the urban landscape based on renewable energy. But I don't see a lot of clean energy people talking about resilience. So we're going to be putting in a lot of infrastructure, which isn't necessarily considering climate change impacts. Likewise, we've got resilient cities. The Rockefeller Foundation has a, the 100 resilient cities uh, um, group that Vancouver signed on to. Uh, we have, as I said, our local municipalities, their flood construction levels based on our sea level rise guidelines. Surrey and Vancouver are going ahead. The bigger municipalities that can afford it are doing it. They're not talking about renewables. These guys aren't talking about resilience. But people are starting to try and think about how to do this. So this is what our report looked at. How do we do it? What are some of the things we could do? Well, pricing carbon is an essential piece of, of emissions reduction. And some people are starting to say, well, you could use some of the revenue for that to help municipalities pay for resilience because the infrastructure uh, upgrades are really expensive and our little municipalities don't have the money. Sometimes the kinds of impacts you're seeing, like the flooding in Dawson Creek earlier this summer, the costs exceed their annual budgets. They're not big and yet the province has downloaded almost all the responsibility for their infrastructure to them. Now, the federal government has put out more money for infrastructure but there's no lens on it saying it has to be resilient. They can put that money into something that's like right down by the sea with no adaptability at all. So we're trying to argue that that lens should be on there, but maybe pricing could be shared. We don't want it to replace renewables, but let's think about resilience or how we could be co uh, finding co-benefits with that pricing perhaps. And so Rachel Notley, wow, she's taking a pounding, poor Rachel, but um, I wouldn't want to be at the Albertan Premier trying to do this stuff, but. Um, and I know it's not perfect, but their carbon pricing system says the revenue gained may only be directed towards adaptation solutions, mitigation solutions, and rebates. So that's, that's, a, that's a little bit of what I'm talking about. But if you're a developer and other professions that are trying to implement this stuff, it's a complete head turner now. We've got developers in Vancouver who are trying to build to the new sea level rise flood construction levels, which is the BC guideline, as I said, which is a meter by 2100. They're already building to this. They've also got to do energy efficiency. They're also trying to prepare for extreme precipitation so we don't get another leaky condo crisis. Um, and so expensive mistakes are starting to emerge that wouldn't have happened had there been a climate change risk lens on the assessments done, for instance, on the development. So an example is one of our huge housing agencies spent about $18 million sealing up all their windows uh, for energy efficiency, for emissions reduction. And then they got a great deal of uh, worry over major heat impacts on low-income residents because there's no way to cool the buildings. They don't have air conditioning. So that kind of seems like a no-brainer. It would have been in there if you'd had the, this lens on your planning process. Likewise, in the flip side, developers were cladding to prevent extreme rain uh, in, ingressing into buildings and then had to remove all of that again to add insulation to put in the energy efficiency piece. So what can we do about this? There's things like LEED. There's no LEED-like resilience standard. LEED doesn't include resilience. It seems like we need some new codes and standards. But there's also these milestone-based processes that most of the municipalities that I'm working with are using. There's five milestones in each, 
They don't connect to one another. Couldn't we do it so milestone one says, do your emissions inventory and your infrastructure inventory and connects the process or jumps to the other process or at least has a trigger for the other process as we go through it. There's another reason we need to do uh, some of this though and at least this is another lens that we need to put on this and that's the crisis that is emerging in our ecosystems and biodiversity. Scientists say we're seeing the sixth mass extinction and it's us that's the asteroid this time. 114 times higher than the background rate of extinction. The benefits to humans like crop pollination and water purification could disappear, but we're not gonna be immune from this extinction. So we need to really think about that in everything we do, in everything we purchase, in everything we build. In all of our urban planning solutions, we can't ignore this. And so people have started to go, well, what's this stuff worth? Because, you know, the business case has to be there. And I really want to put a big caveat on this. You can't sell an ecosystem. <laughs> you can't literally say, oh, well, I'll just pay this and pave it over. But what we're trying to do is say, but what would you have to pay if it wasn't there in order to achieve the services that it provides? And there's an interesting thing about ecosystems. They're carbon sinks. So this is low carbon resilience right here. So the David Suzuki Foundation's natural capital valuation report showed that wetlands and coastal areas are worth 30 to $60 billion in benefits every year, and just in the lower mainland, 5.4 billion. There's another reason we need to preserve ecosystems, and it's carbon related. And that is that there is an extraordinary amount of carbon in the soil. And if we let it go, then uh, that's, uh, there's three gigatons that's the amount that we can burn if we want to get to stay below 1.5 in the soil. So we want to, and two thirds of the current increase in atmospheric CO2 is also, uh, sorry, a third of it is due to soil carbon loss from land use change. So in short, when we're looking at adaptation, we already knew that ecosystems would be helpful because they absorb water, they create shade, they deal with flooding and extreme heat for us. But there's a bunch of other studies that show they also um, increased property values and our quality of life. Uh, mental health, physical health is connected to proximity to ecosystems. And of course, our, this biodiversity crisis, species need them to move and to thrive. So the town of Gibsons, I'll just bring this down to a local example. That is basically a, lo a low carbon resilience example. The town of Gibsons is the first one that I know of, in Canada anyway, to include its foreshore and its forests in its natural, in, uh, sorry, in its municipal asset management strategy. They're actually treating them like they would a bridge or um, a communications infrastructure. So this is taken directly from their eco-asset strategy, and they say our natural capital assets and the ecosystem services they provide are a fundamental integral part of the town's infrastructure. They provide clear advantages over grey or engineered infrastructure. They're cheaper to operate and maintain. They provide free ecosystem services. They don't depreciate. They're carbon neutral or even carbon positive. And look at what they're using, characterizing them as doing. The aquifer, water storage and filtration, creeks, ditches and wetlands, rainwater management, and the foreshore is a natural sea wall. So possible solutions, because we always want to try and talk about solutions. And, you know, I've got a, a tongue-in-cheek example here. When you're making a meal, you've got to think about, uh, there's two different processes. You're cooking and you're also providing the uh, place for people to sit. So I'm trying to have, you know, this is climate change adaptation, this is mitigation. How do we start, how do we get through this process here so that we serve them both at once? Um, so I think that as we already have these milestone planning processes, we can design ones that are linked. Um, we need to put a climate change lens, including risk assessments on all our planning. We need new integrated codes and standards, new pricing approaches and incentives. And I want to say, because of the adaptation fallacy and the concern over, you know, we're going to build seawalls and continue to emit within our municipalities, how do we orient these so that one not only triggers but actually drives the other? Um, we need to prioritize ex ecosystems. And I'd be very interested to hear from you guys if there are examples of this integrated thinking that you've seen that you might suggest or um, that you'd be interested in exploring further. Thank you, Deborah. Um, 
Actually, I'll take, since you've been generous when giving us uh, so much time, I'll make just a couple of comments. One I can't help commenting is that your menu looks rather like a great British breakfast up there. Um, it's, it's definitely influenced. So, so in, in, in future evolutions, it might turn into bannock and salmon or something like that. Um, but I was thinking as you were presenting, uh, you know, about the, and I'm sure our questions and comments will come back to this. Why is it that we maintain this mental bifurcation between adaptation, on the one hand? and mitigation on the other, and what would be good examples of trying to do both at the same time. And in fact, far from the only example, but maintaining, preserving, restoring natural ecosystems, in fact, would have both those impacts for exactly the reasons that the Gibson case provides. So it's a good in of itself, but it actually is a very direct contribution towards maintaining under a rubric of resilience, both services that municipalities want, and as a carbon sink, it makes a contribution towards, towards uh, mitigation. Um, I'm going to open the floor up to comments and questions. Uh, there's our Twitter uh, handle. It help for me to go and sit and look back at our banner for Carbon Talks. If people need an email, I'm just going to look for Kian. Uh, what's the email uh, address, Kian? Uh, it's hashtag Carbon Talks. So, okay, Twitter is hashtag Carbon Talks. If you put Carbon Talks in, you'll find us. Uh, and I'd be very welcome to take comments or questions from participants uh, and also uh, on online. And I see. This lady here. Just give a minute so that the that the uh, yeah. Uh, well, you, you just yeah use it to comment or reply. Go ahead, please. So the work that you do in the agency that you have, and thank you for the work you do. Um, are you are you creating a template that can show the different levels of government? Because it seems like it's an integrated planning issue, really. Because there's a lot of knowledge that. There's a lot of knowledge out there about how to mitigate and adapt, but then it's connecting the dots. So are you creating a template that will allow for the planning process to integrate these different steps? Well, we're right at the beginning of this discussion. So this is something that we published that report in June, and it was a high-level overview of the need for this integration. Um, and. Uh, so we haven't done that yet, but that certainly would be um, a, a good idea. I think it's going to be really interesting to see what the federal plan looks like in November when um, Trudeau's government releases it. Um, I think you know that will be a driver then at that point to see is there a focus on adaptation, is there a major focus on mitigation, and how we should be combining the two. Um, so we haven't moved, we haven't got there yet. We're literally just trying to sort of start this discussion because um, I'm, I, I don't, I mean, ecosystems are an enormously high priority, but they're not the only way to do this. And so for a developer, for instance, you know, there, there could be other considerations. So it might also be something you'd want to do sectorally, you know, for different professions as much as for different levels of government. So all of the above. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get support to do that. Sir? Yeah, do you see any movement in British Columbia or in Canada toward developing um, either a provincial resilience plan or a federal resilience plan? Um, like, for instance, the state of Oregon has put together a resilience plan and um, haven't seen too many indications in Canada yet of uh, jurisdictions moving in, in that direction. Yeah, no, it's been very much the municipalities that have been doing that. Um, I think one of the effects of the Harper government sort of really dampening down any kind of momentum, sorry, for action on this at the federal level had an effect also on the provincial level. And so really the cities started to take leadership. And I think Vancouver is a great example of that. So Vancouver was the first municipality in Metro to have an adaptation plan, and they brought theirs out in 2012. Surrey is competitive with Vancouver and actually is growing faster, and they came out with theirs in 2013. Um, and many people wrote in to the consultation phases for the BC uh, climate leadership planning. Um, and, uh, you know, it's still very much motherhood statements that have been made. There isn't really anything, um, you know, comprehensive, which is um, interesting. I think Ontario produced its climate change plan and uh, according to them they'll have a climate change adaptation plan that will be coming out this fall. Um, so we asked them is it going to be integrated with your emissions planning um, and we'll wait and see if that's if it is. 
Um, so I think that the, from what I'm hearing at the federal level, um, what's been happening is that since June, the federal government has been um, consulting with the provinces on four different streams for a national climate change plan. One of those is on adaptation. And again, I went to the adaptation working group at the federal level and said, are you integrating this across the other three, which are all emissions related or energy related and technology? Um, and uh, from what I hear, the adaptation stream is going to focus heavily on infrastructure um, and infrastructure planning and uh, knowledge transfer and outreach. So um, I, 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 some colleagues of mine have written to Infrastructure Canada and said, are you putting a climate risk lens on this money? Um, so we'll wait to see, but that federal process was done in conjunction with the provinces. So um, when I asked about the integrated thinking, uh, he said, well, by default, because many of the provincial representatives are on all four groups. So um, when you've got one person on all four groups, it's not intentional integration, but it means they're being exposed to all the discussions. So it kind of remains to be seen what the national plan will drive. And I think that the BC plan may change after the national plan comes out as well, when we see what's in it. Uh, Deb, I'll take the opportunity just to ask you, um, sort of building on that, when you go to either talking to provincial governments or when you go to Ottawa, as you do, I mean, do you actually meet people whose you know, full-time job outside of municipalities is adaptation? They get up in the morning, that's what they do. They're yeah, in the, the adapt They're in the, in either the provincial or the federal level, they're in the adaptation section group. Yeah. And, and if you do, and it sounds like that's the case, are they sort of organizationally completely disconnected from the people thinking about energy and other carbon reduction mitigation type areas? Or sort of how does it, how does it play out? Uh, yeah. yeah, they are. Um, that's what's been um, concerning me. I, I just sort of assumed that we would start to integrate. It, 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 th there's a reason why the two came out divergently like this. It's because the first thing we realized was that emissions were causing climate change. So everybody started going, okay, well, how do we reduce our emissions? And that became, yeah. you know, a, a, a paradigm. And then we realized we're not going to be able to do it fast enough and we're going to see climate change impacts. And so everybody said, okay, engineers, how do you deal with, you know, flooding? And that is literally how it has continued. Um, but now we're at a point where the both, you know, are, 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 should really be converging, which is what we're talking about. But I know I'm not seeing that. And um, so at the BC government, they have a adaptation group. Um, but again, it's very—it's at the planning level. They try and help. They try and help planning processes, but it hasn't reached an effective level of provincial policy uh, in BC yet. Um, actually, I don't think it really has in, in any of the other provinces. Quebec and Ontario are trying, um, but yeah, no, they're not. They're not um, integrated, <laughs> and it's the same at the federal level too. There's the adaptation platform, but they're not. They're they're looking across things like economics and. Uh, uh, as far as I could tell, they're not integrated now. But I would love to be surprised. So if someone out there knows better, please tell me, because I'm very interested. Take That's some more comments Mark and questions, there. yeah. So Mark, what is that? Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, I have uh, two queries, one at the micro and one at the macro level. So first, the micro, uh, really as an example of day-to-day -day living. Uh, last winter, um, my wife and I decided to cut down on our fossil fuel use by, by um, going to the electric uh, heater as a default rather than gas fire. The fact is, is that we weren't motivated to do that by a carbon tax. It's peanuts in the process. So it's more of a, uh, a moral stand, if you like. And I'm wondering, um, given that the um, city of Vancouver is now saying 2050, that's the date by which uh, there will be no more installations of gas fires in apartments, condominiums, and so on, as a regulatory approach as opposed to a carbon tax. And in fact, we had, uh, I think it was just last week, uh, Mark Chicard of SFU saying that regulation is the way to go because politically it's easier. So my first query to yourself is, is this switch in philosophy in line with what you're thinking of where we are going. And now my second question is more on the macro level. Uh, last year I went to a, a, um, a seminar downtown and people were lauding the 
benefits of the northern boreal forest opening up to tourism. There was no discussion about how that would impact uh, climate change. And I'm wondering if, in fact, this is an ignored sub subject. Uh, we know that as the Arctic ice decreases, then we're going to absorb more energy. But the same is true for the land. As the snow disappears earlier, we get those methane gases, which are far more potent uh, than carbon. So are you hearing any positive news on how we can mitigate the effects of climate change in the boreal forest. Thank you. So, two questions. <laughs> um, the, yeah, so um, I, I, I'll answer the, the second one first. I don't, I'm not hearing a lot of good news, unfortunately, about that. Um, because, well, you, you've touched on some very important things, like methane is, um, I can't remember how much more potent than CO2. It's much at shorter lived in the atmosphere. It's 25 times? At least 20. It's at least 25 times, and I was about 25 times in it, but it only stays in the atmosphere for, for about 12 years. So carbon stays in the atmosphere for over 200 years. So, you know, methane is a much more potent, more short lived, but could cause us some very, very big problems. Um, there's an Arctic methane emergency group. There's, there's a great deal of alarm about that that just doesn't really seem to make the headlines very much. Um, the other problems that will hit the boreal are things like the heat, um, much more likely to have big forest fires. We're seeing pests, uh, pine beetles killed. You know, in, in our region, thousands and thousands and thousands of hectares of trees, and now the pine beetles kind of gone through. There's other ones appearing, like the spruce, spruce borer. And, um, so I think that the forest may be vulnerable, um, but all the more importance to, to not allow development in it and to protect the ecosystems there, because the more you fragment ecosystems, the more vulnerable they become. And if you look at the, um, the, the proposals for mining gas, et cetera, in the boreal, it's, it's heart stopping because there's, there's so many of them that, you know, putting roads through, it's, and, and, and uh, disrupting the ecosystem up there, we really should be protecting what we have. And that's the only, that's the best chance we've got of making sure that it survives and continues to act as a carbon sink. Um, in terms of carbon pricing and regulation, I'm not the expert on that. So Mark obviously is, is uh, you know, SFU uh, world leader in this stuff. If he says regulations are, are most effective, then um, he's probably right. But at co-founder Nancy Olawider is one of the architects of the BC carbon tax, which has been praised widely as a very good model. Um, not so much for individual homeowners, I think, but more for large consumers like industry. Um, and, but it has to increase in price. And so as it's frozen right now, no one's really, it's, it's not gonna be as effective as it could have been. But there are others in the room who could speak better to the carbon pricing piece, and I welcome that if someone else would like to make a comment in response to that question. The only comment actually I'll make before we go to the next person is, and uh, carbon pricing is a subject, we could do nothing but carbon talks on carbon pricing and not run out of things, points of view, but um, I think part of Mark's point is that it's sort of a political one. Regulation is easier to implement, and he often cites the example of BC Hydro uh, being obliged to move to purely clean hydro sources and not go into building new coal-fired plants. That's kind of a regulation for them. It's easier to implement and less likely to cause political backlash than, than attacks or increasing attacks. Um, but that's a more a matter of tactics and communications than an intrinsic impact. Um, we'll go to the next uh, person who wishes to speak. Hi, thanks, Deb. Um, so actually, a little bird told me that um, right around now, possibly the federal uh, environmental assessment decision on uh, Pacific Northwest LNG um, may drop. So um, this will be, I think, one of the, the first real tests of the Trudeau government's commitment uh, to, to climate action. And as you pointed out, we, you know, they've been very good about talking about, about both things, wanting to do climate change on the one hand and wanting to build more fossil fuel infrastructure uh, on the other hand. And it, so it seems like, um, you know, in spite of the Paris Agreement, you know, we'll, we'll, time will tell, but, you know, it looks like we're basically going to blast through two degrees of global warming. And so, so we do need to think seriously about, um, you know, what our adaptation response is going to be. Um, 
to me, like sea level rise feels so far away. Um, and you know, it's like, okay, one day there'll be a big flood and then we'll just build the dikes higher. <laughs> like, but I'm just wondering like, if you had a billion dollars to spend um, you know, on infrastructure, um, you, you know, where would you put that money right now in terms of you know, triaging the, the, the potential um, you know, resilience <laughs> uh, infrastructure investments that uh, you could think of? Well, if I had a billion dollars, I'd probably go on holiday, actually. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Long holiday, man. Yeah. But, but I'd walk there. I wouldn't. <laughs> um, that, that's just a great question because I, I, we have to think on an ecosystem level. So I would probably create um, a system of uh, facilitation for people to talk to one another about how to respond within watersheds boreal scale planning um, I, I you know nobody really wants another level of government everybody's overstretched already but what government doesn't do very well is think about um, the ecosystems within which we exist and which are mitigating a lot of this stuff for us so you've got organizations like the Fraser Basin Council uh, the Okanagan Basin Water Board the Columbia Basin Trust um, which are all trying to do that kind of a job. And, and the benefit of those organizations is they can bring together all the municipalities in a region and help them think collaboratively. So I would try and resource organizations that do that. And I'd, I'd probably spend half of the billion on that. And I'd spend the other half of a billion uh, educating people. Because I really think that a lot of our problems uh, are partly that there has been at least that amount spent by the oil industry spreading misinformation. So if only we had the same amount of money that they have, we could really help people wake up to you know, what's, what they face in their lifetimes, uh, what their children face, and you know, think on that indigenous level of what's, what are the seventh generation from now face? Um, because it's not pretty in and, and what we're looking at. If you, as you just said, it looks like we're gonna, even if all of the commitments of the Paris Agreement, uh, which are voluntary, were implemented, we'd still hit around 2.7 degrees or more. Um, so, you know, that's, and I, and I would also try and stop people doing geoengineering, because I think that's even scarier than everything else. Um, but to your point about sea level rise being far in the distance, if you're a municipal government that has to spend a lot for its coastal infrastructure, you can't turn that on a dime. So they have to start now to think about it, because, um, you know, it's, it's, if, we're looking at significant sea level rise at least within the next 20 years. So the planning has to start now. But um, I hope I answered your question about the billion dollars adequately, and I'm really hoping you're going to follow that up with some money. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Deborah. Um, I'd like to, to go back to the political will element, I think, of Mark Chicard's point. I, I thought that he and his team did a, a wonderful job with their paper, and it's not, it isn't so much economics as, as political will, I think. When he talks about the $200 price being what we would need just to meet the, the former Harper government's targets, um, then I think when we look at what Canada sent to the UNFCCC as their second biannual report in February, where they really just acknowledged that the gap between our targets and our projections um, it's just, it's expanding, not converging. It's, it's, the, it's the most terrifying graph that I've ever seen. And I think they, they must have done that provocatively because it, it, it speaks to the fallacy of the entire premise. They know. But, but I think on, on a political level, it, it's so unpalatable, I think. And to me, that was what Mark and his team were trying to say, that it, it, we, we, can't, we can't embrace the idea of a $200 carbon price seen the hysteria in the papers about even coming to terms with what no gas fire by 2050 might mean to restaurants or small businesses. And, and so I, I think I just really applaud your, your comment, Deborah, about public education. And, and I would connect that, I think, to a suggestion about really massive focus on what kind of public dialogues we can encourage where it isn't so much just the top-down driven information, it's engaging all kinds of people in looking for the convergent opportunities, looking for what are we going to do as a, I guess we're a fortunate country for now, but there are, as you said, I mean, there are no fences high enough. Um, 
there's a, a wonderful little book that is available now. Um, his name is Giles Slade. Um, it's called American Exodus, uh, published in 2013. Um, and he, it's interesting, he did his PhD without having immigration papers in San Diego. At, so he was a Canadian, noting his own experience, really quite benign, and watching what was happening to illegal Mexicans right beside him. So he started thinking about forced climate migration in the 80s, not, not now. And so his argument is, is very blunt. Um, America will face what the rest of the heating world is facing. Uh, Americans are, are going to be coming north uh, in extraordinary numbers, and not by 2100. You know, the, the point you just made about maybe three degrees by 2050. Uh, three, it's, three meters of sea level. Sorry, three, 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 three meters. Yes. But this is not long term anymore. You know, we're in the middle of it, and people aren't able to really process it yet. And so I, I just, I really like your thought about massive, um, well, public education, but public dialogue. Thanks. Yeah, um, I was thinking American Exodus might be what happens if Trump gets in, actually, but um, everybody's coming up here for another reason. Um, but, uh, I mean, if you look at the instability that's, been, that's emerged in the EU since the Syrian refugee crisis, um, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg in terms of climate migration. Um, you, you, I'm not by any means claiming that the Syrian crisis is completely due to climate change, but the destabilization caused by drought and crop failure certainly does have a destabilizing effect in geopolitical regions where there's already um, strife and, and danger. And um, we, you know, we, we've, we don't even really feel touched by that because they went to the EU, but there will be crises that bring people here. We're a destination country. Look at the space we have. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's sort of visceral impacts like that that start to um, reveal how important it is to plan for these things. And actually, ironically, ACT was formed in the first place because we were looking at UN projections of 350 million climate refugees by 2050 and going, how are we going to prepare for this? Um, so, uh, but, you know, in terms of uh, how we move this, this dialogue along, I go back to the adaptation fallacy. I don't think we're connected enough to the people in Bangladesh or the small island states who I've been to those, I haven't been to Bangladesh, but I've been to um, the Philippines, for instance, to small little islands there. People are drowning there. And they, I have been asked the question in a room full of probably 500 people, why aren't you guys reducing your emissions? We're drowning and I'm just, I'm like, I'm, I'm so sorry, you know, I, I, it, we don't feel that visceral guilt yet, but we should. And there has to be more than just our self-interest and uh, at stake here because um, it's turning into murder. You know, this is, this is literally uh, on, blood on our hands if we don't do it. Um, that said, like Mark's an economist, he'll tell, you know, I mean, that's, it doesn't work like that. It, the business case always wins the day. The boys in the back room going, uh-uh, we can't do that. So how do we make a business case out of that? I don't know. Um, uh, I think that there is a lot to be said about how fast we could be transitioning to less intensive emissions, inten less, in, less emissions intensive fuel sources and um, you know, we might see tipping points in that that we're not expecting. I think technology and people like Elon Musk and others are driving uh, processes that may take off much more quickly than we think they will. Um, and maybe another piece of it is to really try and talk to people on the individual level. What do you, you know, you, your, your point about you took a moral stand, you changed your heating source. Well, if lots and lots and lots and lots of people did that, then you know, th that, that would be transformative in itself. So how do we talk to people from the heart? How do we get people connected? Um, yeah. Uh, this isn't a question, it's a comment on the Twitter feed and it's a, a senior advisor who, who works for FCM, that's the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, Green Municipal Fund, uh, and the statement is, their new $75 million program funded by Infrastructure Canada will support Canadian municipalities in both mitigation and adaptation. So yes, through a climate risk lens. Okay. 
glad to hear that comment while we're doing while we're doing this live. So thanks very much. A uh, couple of hands up. I think the gentleman here in the and then at the back and then down to the front again. Good afternoon. I would just like to make a couple of observations. I uh, I, I grew up in the interior of British Columbia and. Uh, realized over the last couple of years that I really didn't uh, have all the information that I needed to know to make judgments on certain things like climate change and large business development and uh, the environment. So I spent the last two years in my industry trying to uh, work through government to um, find what opportunities are available. And a couple of your statements were, were waiting for, for the federal government, or were waiting for the provincial government to, to create regulations. Um, in my experience, if you wait, you're going to continue to wait. And uh, all, um, we, we tend to, as humans, always think that there's a solution somewhere else, whether it's in Europe, or whether it's in the States, or whether it's in Ottawa. But the reality is, is that there's a group of people in British Columbia that are as intelligent as any, any other group uh, in the world. And what we don't do is look locally as we possibly can. And one of the solutions is, is to take some of these um, opportunities to our local governments, um, to, the, to the regional districts, to the municipalities, and work on those changes there. Because, as I said, um, all politics is local. Uh, it's the beginning, and when I look at the climate change issue now, it's it's almost like we it's it's very fear-based, and we're starting to uh, approach the solution in the middle when we've forgotten about the base again. And um, I, I think it's it's important that we keep the issue out front for the federal and global politicians, but at the same time. British Columbia has to do what it needs to do in all of its small communities, whether it's the villages or, or municipalities of over 1,500 people, that those groups have to have the ability to be able to do it. Um, in my experience also, um, municipal governments as well as provincial governments have three or four or five layers of bureaucracy that has pits engineers against engineers and everyone trying to find a solution on their own when there are solutions out there. And until we can get to a position where we can have people look at it from the outside and say, you're making this much too complicated, we need to take about four levels of, of government out of it so that we can get to the issue very quickly, I think it's going to be an issue. I want to comment on one other thing, though, and that is public perception. I'm in an industry right now where what we want to be able to do is reuse and reclaim. And it's very difficult for us to be able to do that because of public perception. So you're right. Municipalities and provincial governments do not want to spend money on um, public awareness campaigns. It seems like it's, it's just there's no value in it. But to be honest with you, if I had a billion dollars, that's where I'd be spending my billion dollars. And that is, is making people aware of what's going on, and then trying to really hit the solutions at a very basic home level, uh, as opposed to always trying to get it at the federal and provincial level. So mm -hmm. just some comments. Thank you for that comment. Um, we'll just go to, I think Deb, we'll just carry on and take a few more comments, because we're in, down to the, about our last 10 minutes. Hi. Um, my name is Meredith, and I, I run a group called Student Energy, and we do energy education globally in terms of energy entrepreneurs and launching people kind of into the world of solutions in terms of climate change. Um, and my interest in your speech was a little bit on your piece about education, because I feel like, at least in the world of energy where I operate mostly, education is really failing to create new ways of innovation to teach people how to collaborate to break barriers between silos. Um, and also how people influence their politicians and their government is pretty much the opposite of how you would go about influencing someone who is a typical media consumer online these days. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on effective education mechanisms you'd seen within resilience or within climate. Um, I, I think that that, 
I don't actually. So I, I mean, I think we're constantly trying to figure out what to do. And the conversation around behavioral change and how to motivate people has been raging back and forth from doom and gloom, just depresses people, and people get climate fatigue and then they don't want to do anything and they stick their heads in the sand and just go party on till it's over. Uh, but if you're saying, no, there's lots of hope, then you know, people get falsely reassured and then become complacent and don't act. And so, you know, we've kind of got this like real head scratcher because we've been saying these things for 30 years. Let's face it, this is not a new discussion. Like, well, I, I mean, I think this integration discussion is new now because the, 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 these discussions have been going on and developing separately. But um, the actual discussion over climate change is an issue, what should we do about it? You all know, we've all, we've all said this a million times to each other. Um, how do we get people to do something about it? Well, I, I mean, um, I think there is a, uh, there, there are many different ways. There's always like m many paddles, one canoe, right? So, um, um, raise, it's like when you, I, it makes me think of a Prius. So when people have heard that people actually are in danger of crashing their Prius fairly uh, uh, often because they're so busy looking at how they're saving gas between us <laughs> switching from the battery to the gas because they're, tra they're trying to like do it so they never actually use any gas. Well, that's an example of how gamifying stuff and incentivizing it somehow, giving people something they're trying to beat or, you know, could, could be one way. So we're thinking about apps that show people, you, you know, how much your water footprint is or your carbon footprint, um, uh, you know, to, to, to make it something that you sort of think about in terms of your everyday actions. What are you buying? And so there an interesting... Um, conversation about sustainable procurement. If you could put a lens over all organizations' procurement processes, where is this coming from? What, what kind of impact does it have? So I think there's a huge amount of um, potential in the internet, to be honest. Uh, um, as long as Edward Snowden's not, you know, as long as you know, we, we actually can talk to one another and not worry too much. Um, uh, you know, that there's these tools now, visual tools that can be propagated very quickly that people can understand and that we could maybe use to improve education. Um, but I think that, dis that, that discussion and where is this half billion dollars, Mark, uh, that we could put into it, right? Because we need to invest more in that still. This gentleman. Oh, okay, yeah. And then we'll come back to, yeah. Um, Deborah, you mentioned the word murder, and, and I would agree with that. I would take that point that, in effect, we are actually murdering some of those people in the, the poorer economies. And, and in that respect, um, you know, in the Second World War, I know the U.S. totally transformed their economy, and, you know, their industry to make weapons instead of cars, and, and the lifestyle of people totally changed. Women went to work and men went to war. Do you think it's time to declare war on climate change? Yeah, actually, that I'm trying to think who said that. Somebody else has actually. I think it might be Bill McKibben has compared this to a war footing, yeah, and that we should be responding in exactly that way. Um, I don't think. I think so long as you can go to Safeway and and buy all the groceries you want and fly off to Mexico for a holiday, that you're not going to believe it's a war. Um, I don't think. I I I think. You know, we see this, ex I, I, I move through a lot of different circles and there are people, I, I know people who are so terrified and upset and worried that they're, they're struggling to work on a daily basis. There, there are climate scientists out there who, um, you know, just, they, they know their message isn't gonna play because nobody wants to hear it. And then you get people all the way on the other spectrum going, it'll be fine, don't worry about it. Just don't make such a fuss, oh, back off, you know, and so, you try and navigate on that spectrum somewhere. But, um, I mean, there's this sort of uh, sad reality that when there's a big disaster, it brings it home. So Fort Mac, I think, brought it home. A lot of people lost their houses and thought they were insured because they paid them off. I would, we, we were talking to the director of catastrophic list from the insur risk from the insurance bureau, and he said they literally were having conversations with people going, no, I don't have insurance. I paid my house off. I don't need that. So they literally lost everything. And they oh. were significant properties. Um, so that kind of thing, you know, wakes you up and then there's a window of opportunity to act. Um, 
And that does sort of put it more on a kind of war footing, because it is a catastrophe. It's something terrible that's happening right in front of you. Um, so, but again, I, I, I think that comment that many pedals one canoe is a quote from Richard Lipsy that when, when we first started ACT, people keep saying, well, should we do this or that? No, do both, and, 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 and. So yes, some people will probably respond to that message. We should talk to them that way. But there are many other ways to convey stuff, like through apps and sustainable procurement and other approaches that we should be using as well. Carbon pricing, whatever we can do, we should do all of it. This, this lady. Um, yes, yeah, we'll just take. I'll if be you super could, quick. Yeah. So uh, everybody's referencing this billion dollars, and I have a sustainable procurement platform that needs two billion of it. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, on the note of sustainable procurement, we have um, a resource that we've spent six years building. It's the fastest growing directory for sustainable procurement in um, the world, starting in North America. But I have people signing up all the time from all over the world. It's greenpagesdirectory.net, and you should write that down, greenpagesdirectory.net. So you can share your information um, about uh, leading edge innovation and why people should do things, and then it points to a directory and a database that allows people to help figure out how they can do it. Because in my experience, governments impose minimal standards, but I think it's really gonna be the private sector and innovators that really move things uh, forward in a faster way. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just take one more comment and then I'll, I'll make a co comment and we'll wrap it up. Uh, the people who have suffered a tragic disaster, like people in Fort Mac, uh, it doesn't matter what their personality is going to be it's real to them. But for the rest of the majority of us humans in Fortress North America, who can only abstract this, uh, maybe we should be taking the approach in public education. So this is actually a question. Mm -hmm. Do you think we have been lacking sophistication to recognize different personality types? Now, just as much as you know from the economist, I'm presuming you're also uh, not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, although who knows what hidden, hidden talents you may have. <laughs> But perhaps the education must become more sophisticated to identify different types of personalities and give the messaging to those types of personalities instead of one shot fits all. Because we already know the silver bullet doesn't exist in climate change adaptation or mitigation. And neither do our psychological processes and cultural uh, orientations. Yeah, I, I'm actually a communications expert, so <laughs> um, that's, that's my background. And different language for different audiences is absolutely key. Um, and so we're talking to all different sectors, we're talking to lawyers, we're talking to engineers, we're talking to utilities managers, um, trying to learn what's, what language do you guys speak so that we can convey this stuff in resources and finding out how it's uh, landing for them in their practice. But also their, sorry, the microphone, but also their, their personalities, what motivates them. It's not just their language. It's like, oh my God, this is real, I got to act. Yeah. To create the urgency that it's real to them and it's right now. Yeah. And the Trump, the, one of the issues with climate change adaptation is it's quite a hard thing for an individual to do by themselves. It has to be a, a regional thing. You can certainly make your home more resilient to extreme uh, precipitation. Um, you can definitely check your drainage, your gutters. There are lots of things that you can do. But when it comes to actually financing, um, you know, ways to do this that are systemic, you, you need to talk to the governmental level. So we need, it's that and, and, and thing again. But we've just finished doing um, three meetings with the residents of the most vulnerable area in, in Surrey, in, in Crescent Beach, which is um, highly vulnerable to sea level rise. It's, it's it's built, it's right down there, and there's a dike, and there's the sea. And, you know, we, it was the first time that I've spoken directly to people and shown them what their water level is going to look like over their house in 2020, 2040, 2070. And I was worried that they would be very upset. And so we did um, try and convey it in a way that was constructive and helpful. And we, th this was an, an initiative of the city as the kickoff for their coastal flood adaptation strategy. And it was a very different kind of talk to even the one I gave you guys today. It was much more based. We, we looked to, we wanted to engage them around their values. What is it that you want to see in the future? How would you like to work with the city? That kind of thing. 
And I found people extremely constructive, very well educated and enthusiastic to do something. Um, they weren't prone to uh, panic, actually. Um, they basically were like, okay, what can we do? How can we help? We want to work on this. And one lady, to her enormous credit, stood up and said, and how are we reducing our emissions while we do this? And how can we all get into electrification of vehicles? And I said, you know, there it is. It's coming from the people in the room. So I think we also need to not underestimate what people actually know and try and help them figure out how to act. Um, but Telling your leadership is one of the biggest ones, and I constantly say this, one letter to your prime minister, one letter to your mayor, um, one letter to your premier is worth a thousand voices because people know that most people won't write. So it's really worth letting leadership know what you will support because they're afraid they're gonna get chucked out if they do stuff that's not popular. Thank you very much, that's a very great way to end, uh, which is a, shall we say, a confronting topic.